Do you want to earn more? Work less and enjoy what you do each day. It's no secret, it can be done. This podcast with Dr. T will not only educate and inspire you, it will also teach you how to do more and be more with the time you already have. It will be like a shot of adrenaline straight into the heart of your business. Here is your host, Tyson Franklin. Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of It's No Secret with Dr. T. With me today is one of Australia's greatest authors in small business and marketing. He's been around for a number of years. I've known him for over 25 years. He's got 13 books under his belt. Number 14 is coming out very soon. I'd like you to, to put your ears together for Andrew <laughs> Griffiths. Andrew, how are you doing? G'day, mate. How are you doing? Do you like this that? It's nice to be uh, <laughs> Nice to be on a podcast show with you. This is uh, This is something new. I like it. Well, I've had you down on my list. I said this to um, Jeff Anderson uh, only last week that I said when I did when I decided to do the podcast, I had a list of people that were written down there. But then between writing the list and now, you get these other people just seem to pop in in between, and you go, oh yeah, okay, we'll do an interview here, do another one there. So I'm slowly now I've gone back to my original list and I'm ticking <laughs> everybody off that I know is going to add value to the people that are actually tuning in and listening. Yeah, great. Yeah, awesome to be here. And yeah, mate, we do go back, you know, many, many years now. And uh, and and such a lot has changed in those years, Tyson. Wow. Well, we, so, we go way back. I remember when your first book came out. Yeah, that was 2000. So this is the 20th year, 20th year since my first book, 101 Ways to Market Your Business. Yeah, and, so uh, I knew you before that book came out. And I remember it coming yeah. out and it was, at the time, a cracker of a book. Yeah, and and it was a simple book. It was just you know at a time then too, the internet was just coming into play. People were realizing that you could use it for things other than porn. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, and and it was a it was a simple book, hundred and one ways to market your business, and that's what it was. Yeah, it, it was based on my own experience, mainly in Cairns and my own businesses, I guess before in Sydney and places. But it was really just his his whole pile of bits of advice on how to get more customers, make more money, do all that stuff. And I worked on a premise that, you know, most small business owners don't have much time, don't have much money and don't have a lot of skills outside their own area of expertise. And no one was more surprised than me than when a publisher said, yeah, we'd love to publish it. And no one was even more surprised when a publisher said, oh, my God, it's it's become a bestseller. And now it's, it's sold in 65 countries, been translated into everything from Chinese to Russian to Nigerian to Indonesian to freaking um, Thai uh, to... Uh, all kinds of different languages with a, a simple idea that just had value and kind of took off. So considering it was written 20 years ago, have you ever had pressure on you from a publisher to go, hey, Andrew, do you want to do a, an updated version? Yeah, yeah, I have. But I, I mean, I, what, I, what I'm actually working on at the moment is I'm going to republish that book uh, next year and it's going to be 101 old school marketing ideas. Uh, and and the reason is I got an email from someone recently. Like it's it's out of date. There's nothing yeah. about SEO. There's nothing about any the, of that. You have you have used your fax machine. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I keep a fax machine because I feel guilty. You know, because I've suggested you should do fax campaigns, and I feel that people need to send it to me. Um, but uh, I got an email from a guy a while ago, and he said, "You know what? I just read 101 ways to market your business," and I cringe when I see. 101 ways to market your business in the email subject line because yeah. someone will go, oh, it's really out of date or whatever. And this guy said, you know what? Even though it's an older book and it's, you know a lot has changed in 20 odd years, the ideas are fabulous and they're great old school marketing. And uh, and and that kind of sowed the seed. I, I did some workshops with Bree um, around old school marketing and I'm a big believer in old school oh, marketing. So, so am I. I, I think you there's know? certain parts of old school marketing especially today, which are probably even more powerful than what they were Completely. 20 years ago, like a hard copy newsletter. Oh, anything in the mail, yeah. in my view. Like when was the, I went to the post office box this morning and I got two bills. You know, normally years back, 10 years ago, I'd go to the letterbox and every day there'd be 20, 30, 40, 50 pieces of, new, of, of mail. And, uh, and for me, that's an opportunity. And, and I think that people misunderstand it. They kind of think, oh, if you're talking about old school, you're locked in that. Hell, you and I both know we're online, we're digital, we're you know we're we embrace new. Yeah. But I think what happens is new stuff has also made people lazy. It's so easy to do an EDM, to do an electronic direct marketing campaign, or to or to do a Facebook thing, and they're great in many ways. But it's also lazy to print a brochure, to print a freaking business card, 
I mean, I laugh at that. People go, no, no, you know, it's so millennial. You don't have business cards. I'll have a business card till the day I die. I'll hand one to Lucifer at the gates, you know, like type of thing. And and you look at that and kind of go, to me, smartness is about having that balancing act. And I'm starting to see a lot more businesses now going, hang on, we need to incorporate some of the old school stuff with the new school stuff. And that's what becomes really effective. So if you were talking to someone now, had their own business, and Mm -hmm. you were going to give them, say, your top three old school marketing ideas, we just said, you know, like doing a hard copy newsletter, I think is still valuable because no one does it. Mm-hmm. And business cards, I think, definitely still have value. Mm-hmm. Have you got another one? Oh, a favourite? I, I, got, I got so many of them. Um, where do I start with that? The, the old school. Um, I, I, again, for me, I guess a hard copy in the mail, but also having a hard copy brochure, you know, to differentiate those two is really important. Um, I, I think from that point of view, um, again, picking up the phone and actually going to see people it, it is as strange as that sounds. That to me has almost become old school, yeah. you know, in, in a world where we're constantly we're emailing and I kind of understand that. Um, sending people gifts. You know, I send out a lot of books. I've probably sent 10,000 books out in the last 20 years as a gift to actually get something to turn up in the mail physically that arrives um, again around that. And, you, you know, you've been doing that for years, Tyson. You know what it's like. Yeah, well, i got this. Uh, there's a, a lady, um, Maylee uh, Galleon. She's been on this podcast and she is into sending out cards, yep. gifts, and, and it is, it's old school. But when I went to the mail the other day and I got a birthday card from her mm. and then her photo on the back of it, straight away, it's a reminder that she exists. I have my own kind of card that I send out to people as well. And, uh, and it's the same kind of concept. This, you know, just with a message on the inside, the script for our life is written in pencil, not carved in stone. You know, Andrew Griffiths, that simple little piece of material, which costs nothing and costs nothing to send, is extraordinarily powerful when it comes to, uh, I think, creating connection, creating engagement, making you, you know, stand out from the crowd in a, in, a, in a market which is so cluttered and full, and always has been, but we didn't realise how cluttered and full could actually things could actually get until now. So, I, I, I think, I, and I really observe stuff. I really, I was at a coffee shop the other day, yeah, and uh, and I, I've moved to Melbourne recently, like in the last six months. And it's down the road from where I live. Having a cup of coffee and, and the coffee shop owner walked out and said, oh, hi, I've noticed you've been here a few times. My name's Matt. Just like to introduce myself and say good day. And, uh, and, you know, please look, if you ever get anything that's not right, coffee's not right or any of the food, can you do me a favour? Come and tell me. It's, you know, I'd really appreciate that rather than you kind of being unhappy and not coming back. Like that's, a, that's an amazing thing to do. How rare does that something like that actually happen? Where someone gets well, not it down enough. enough, not enough, and someone actually comes out and shakes your hand and says, "G'day, thank you for being, you know, thanks for being our, you know, such a for, for coming here when there's so much choice around." Uh, I mean, they're the kind of things that I think more and more um, are great ways to market our, ourselves. I mean, how loyal do I feel to that cafe? You know, simply because of what <laughs> yeah. that guy's done. Where else am I going to go? I'd feel like I'm I'm cheating on them, you know, if I'm having a coffee elsewhere. But it's even when you said picking up the telephone. Yeah, you've done some work for somebody. Pick up the phone up, yeah, that that evening, and give them a call, and just yep. say, "I'm from yeah ABC Priority Limited, and um, just want to see how was the service that we provided today." Mm-hmm. Especially in healthcare, especially like in podiatry, we used to if somebody came in for ingrown toenail surgery. Towards the end, there we were making sure to ring them that night, just to ask them how they're feeling. Yeah, we told mm-hmm. them this is what's going to happen as the anaesthetic wears off. It might throb mm-hmm. a little bit, take two Panadol, put your feet up. And then you give them a call and they go, oh, thanks for, thanks for calling. Yeah, it's mind-blowing. And it takes 60 seconds to do. Mm. It, the, the old school stuff is how you actually build relationships and build solid engagement. And I think it works across all kinds of... of uh, I think it works across all age groups. And I, and I think it's a really interesting kind of a shift um, that I'm seeing in business. And look, one of the real observers of this or, or kind of manifestations of this for me is the age of the hipster. You know, we're, we're, we're living in, in, it's the hipster revolution. Yeah. So, and, and you you look at that though, and I think one of the things that hipsters are actually really good at is service. 
And, 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 I, and I say this, I love hipsters and I love the fact that what they do is they transform industries. So what's your definition of a hipster? Uh, you know, tattoos and a beard. Yeah, yeah, two things I don't have. Well, actually, I haven't shaved for a week. That's, that's know, as good as it gets. I, I'm a closet hipster, <laughs> you know, I, 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 and generally they're skinny. Well, that's not always true. But, but what I see, like down here, you know, in Melbourne, um, well, actually around Australia, there wouldn't be too many coffees served today that haven't got a hipster somewhere in the production line. Yeah, true. You know? there wouldn't, you go to cafes, you go down here, you go, there's barbers that'll take $65, $75 for a shave. They're booked out. They're, there's people lining up out the street, you know, and you go inside and, and there's these heavily tattooed dudes with beards or, or heavily tattooed women. It doesn't really matter. It's not a sexist or a gender thing. But what they do, the hipsters have re-energized industries that were that were kind of a bit bland. They've reinvented uh, hairdressing salons. They've reinvented um, barbers. They've reinvented cafes. Now they're starting to be hipster accountants, hipster lawyers, you know, hipster mechanics, hipster th- this whole thing. And what they do really well is that, that they are great at engaging. You have conversations with these people that can actually look you in the eye. They have a sense of fun. They charge what they're worth, so they're building yeah. better businesses because they're not selling just on <clears> cheap, you know. And 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 we're glad to go there because there's a there's a coolness factor to it. And I think that's something that I, I find it fascinating how bit by bit the the hipsters are moving into different industries as they get a bit older, and uh, and, and you kind of go, wow, they they, they are rigor, reinvigorating industries that are tired. But the good and, point uh, behind that though is if you can't grow a beard, that's fine, and if you don't want to get tattoos, that's fine. But take on the way that they approach and connect with people at absolutely at the at that storefront. That's the, that's the key. That's the key. I'm working with a guy at the moment. He's a hipster financial planner. Now you think of financial planners. I'm sorry, I've spoken to a million financial planning conferences. The average age is about 57. It's lots of old white guys, you know, that, are, <laughs> that have made a lot of money pretty easily for a long time. And now this new hipsters coming through. Guy I'm working with, a couple of young financial uh, advisors. Um, they, they, their take is so different. They're financial coaches. You know, they're, they're, they're so passionate about getting their clients out of financial crap because they don't know how to budget. They don't know how to save. They don't know how to do this stuff. And, you know, I, I'm sitting in meetings with these guys and they're talking to their clients saying, now, listen, George, it's Friday afternoon. This is when you normally go out after work and you blow your weekly money. Now, don't do it this week. You got to save up. You got a baby on the way. Do you hear me? Go home, dude. Go yeah. home. And, and I'm going, <laughs> Seriously, you know, they, and they're going, yeah, because he's got to get his money together. He's got to have a 10 grand buffer zone. He's got a baby on the way and he's got nothing. And I'm going, wow, I love that passion. And that passion's that word that you and I both know that I, I think it's a key ingredient in success is, is you've got to have that element of passion about what it is you're doing. It doesn't matter, you know, whether you're a proctologist or whether you're a rock star, you know, you, you've got to have that passion around you that, that fires it up. I think passion without ability you know, is not enough, but passion on its own it, it is a great starting point for, for being successful in business uh, in, in many ways. Yeah, you know, so. and I think it's it's also stepping out from behind that counter and engaging yeah. with people. Like you said, that guy in the coffee shop walked out to you and said, have you got any concerns? Introduced himself. And I know I used to be in the podiatry clinic and if I saw people sitting in the reception area and I didn't have a patient, I'd, <laughs> I'd go and sit next to them and say, oh, hi, I'm Tyson, I own the podiatry business. Um, who are you booked in with? Yeah. And they go, oh, yeah, I'm booked in with, say, Andrew. And I said, oh, okay. I said, well, look, Andrew's actually 10 minutes late. Well, he's running behind. I'm free. Would you like to see me now? And they go, yeah, yeah that'd be great. I'd take him in the room and I'd end up doing the treatment. So, and you know that that type of thing they're going to talk about. And I used to always have my, um, my guitar, so my, my left-handed guitar sitting in my consultation room as well. And I remember this young kid coming in. He said, oh, do you play the guitar? I said, yeah. He said, oh, so do I. I said, well, when you come in next, bring your guitar with you. I said, I'm going to block out an extra five, ten minutes at the end of the visit and uh, we'll have a little jam. Show me what you did. Show, teach me something. It. So he <laughs> came in with his guitar. We hooked it up and we played for about ten minutes afterwards. I said, well, when you book back in, just tell the girl at the front you need an, an extra ten minutes so we can uh, do this again. When he left, Christine said to me, that kid will never, under any circumstances, let his parents take him anywhere but this clinic. Yeah, so true. And, and you know what it is, though, Tyson, which I think is, um, I think you either have it or you don't. It, it is, you've got to basically like people. Yeah, true. 
You know, like, and in a lot of businesses, what happens, the, the, the more successful the business becomes, the less interaction the business owner has with customers, you know, because they spend more time at the back looking at Excel spreadsheets, you know, and because they start to measure their business by Excel spreadsheets instead of actually having that interaction with people that are walking by and people that are at the front and serving it. And I think it's a great lesson to be learned from that. I get asked all the time, you know, why do I do coaching still? You know, like I'm, I've got a really busy business, do a lot of work around the world. And, uh, and people go, how do you have time for coaching? And I kind of go, well, the coaching is so important for me because it keeps me really connected to my customers. It keeps me really connected to what's happening in business. It keeps me really connected to new authors or speakers. And, and I think that people kind of go, oh, the customers are a bit of a hassle, they're a bit of a pain, you know, they're demanding all that kind of jazz. And look, I get that, we're all like that. But but when when a business owner gets too disconnected from the business, and we also live in a world where everyone's trying to get this business that you can run without, you know, having any involvement and all these kind of unicorn ideas. Yeah. Um, and, and the reality of it is that you, you've got to want to sit next to your patients, you, you know, and it's, it's, it's about respect and it's about respect for people and it's about treating them as individuals and it's about um, making the time to do stuff like sit next to someone in a waiting room and go, how you doing? He's tied up, but I'm not. Come on, let's go and, uh, and, and I'll treat you. Well, I had a, someone on the show, uh, Kerry Rome, two, three episodes ago. And he, he was actually saying the same thing that he calls it CEOs become too focused on metrics and they forget why they started the business in the first place. So that, exactly. so they get focused on numbers and spreadsheets and then they go and talk to their team and all they're talking about is numbers and spreadsheets and they don't realize that your team and your customers, they don't care whether you get rich or not. No. Your team want to look after the customers. Mm. And your, your customers want to get served. And if, and if you lose vision of why you started the business and they said you got to, the CEOs have got to remember to keep sharing that vision with their team and get them fired up about we're here to provide this service. We're not yeah. here just to make money. And, and the interesting part about that is though that, um, that, that so many people, uh, I, I think, or they, they, they don't see that the value in that. You know, of being that connected. Like, if you look at any board, you tell me that any board of a bank, NAB, let's pick a bank at, at random, and say you get the board and you get them, you get them working as a teller for a day. Yeah. You're on the board. Part of your responsibility is once every three months, you spend half a day with with customers. You, you tell me that business would not change fundamentally as a result of that when people actually see what's there. Like, how far away is a boardroom? And it's easy to say, oh, well, the fundamental decisions aren't made there. The operational decisions aren't made. No, but the culture is formed there, yeah. you know, and, and that's where the culture starts. I remember, um, do you remember Tom Potter? Did you ever come across Tom Potter? Oh, Eagle yeah, Eagle Boys. Pizza? And I, I always remember, I did a few jobs with him, and I always remember him talking so passionately about the fact that, you know, whenever he traveled, he'd always go and work for a shift in the busiest time in one of the Eagle Boys. He'd go to a drive through or work behind a cash register or work in the kitchen or whatever. And he said, that's where they got the best ideas from. Someone would be coming through the window or out the front and say, you know, what's important to you? What do you need? What aren't we doing? He would ask those questions. And, and he said, that's always the best, the best advice came from, directly from the customer at eight o'clock on a crazy Friday night when someone said, why don't you just put that stuff over there and we can help ourselves, <laughs> you know? And of course we're all too in it to even see that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and this is what innovation is also about, you know? So whilst it's great to have that connection from our customers at the grassroots level, if you're talking to your team as well, you know, I, I'm working with a lady at the moment, um, coaching her on writing a book and she works for a, an airport, large airport. And she said their best ideas come from the guys that are actually on the ground, lifting bags, mowing lawns, doing all this stuff. Yet they have an innovation team over there. Nothing comes out of them. It's just a million dollars a year in salaries. But the actual ideas that are great in the business happen at that you know, really grassroots level. Um, so there's a lot to be said from playing in that space. But, but we tend to feel that the more successful we get, we should distance ourselves from that. And I think it's a, I think it's a fundamental error. Yeah, well, we used to have, when a podiatrist would start in the clinic, we would have them, they had to learn all the tasks that the receptionist did at the front. Yeah, great idea. Didn't have to do it as quick, but they had to know how to make a booking Someone on the computer, yeah. how, to, how to take money, yeah, how to do a receipt, create an invoice, deal with veteran affairs. They had to know how all that worked. And the reason I wanted them to learn it 
was one, if the receptionists need a hand, I expect you to dive in there and help them, not just stand mm. back and watch. But also appreciate when you're dumping a whole pile of things on their desk and you're saying, can you do this for me? And they've got four people standing in front of them. Understand, they probably can't help you right now. <laughs> they've got yeah. four people. In, them. in fact, they probably need you to help them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's why I always liked when new people joined the team because they would mm. see how things were being done and they go, why do you do this here? Why is that still done? That doesn't make any sense. And you, all mm. of a sudden you realize, yeah, that was an outdated system that we used to do. No one's, no one's brought it up. Yeah, yeah. Time to make a change. The way that we've always done it, concept, because our brains get so comfortable with we're doing that. Um, I, I work with a mob uh, that are called um, uh, Institute of Lean Systems, and, and they do lean operating. Have you encountered lean no. systems? No. Like it's, it's, so it's, it's an idea that initiated with Toyota, um, and, and basically what it is, it's, it's, a, it's a process which is kind of reviewing how we work in a work practice and look for ways to improve productivity. And, um, and they, they do things like have like time-lapse photography of a space, a working space. And McDonald's were really big on this kind of thing when they first started. You know, we saw it on the movie Founder, if anyone watched yeah. that, um, which was around this concept of saying, if I walk over to that bench 100 times a day, you know, like that's using, say, an hour of collective time a day, 365 days a year, that's 365 hours. That's, you know, $4,000 a year. All I need to do is bring that bench over here. Yeah, and, and, and so you move the bench to here where there's a space and that will now save time, productivity, reduce the risk of someone slipping and accidents. So it's all about that kind of stuff. But it's also then about project management, having things they call Kanban boards. Which oh, are, yeah, they're great. All the projects you have, green, red, yellow, where are you, et cetera. Um, so the, the whole, you know, lean thing is extraordinary. And, uh, and, I, and I look at um, my friend Ray that, uh, that runs this company in America, and it's just extraordinary what that fresh pair of eyes concept, which is what they are. They're the fresh pair of eyes kind of people that just come in and say, you know, like, why does that go from there to there? And just asking that question, most of the time, the answer is exactly what we were just talking about, Tyson. I, I don't really know. It's just, it was always there, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and you feel kind of silly when you're saying it, you go, Oh yeah, but it's human nature. You know, we, we, the things over there, that's where we go. Rather than saying, well, if I move this to here, I won't have to walk so far. I won't have to do this so often. It's like setting up a system. We don't set up a system because it's a pain up the bum to do it. Yet when we finally set up systems and it's so much easier and saves all that time, we go, why didn't we do this before? Yeah. You know, so. I oh, know I've got a friend, uh, um, Dave Freeze. And he's a lawyer in uh, Philadelphia and he, but what he does when a new employee starts with him, he says to him, I think it's in their employment contract. You will not come with any suggestions or changes for the first six months until <laughs> you've seen how the whole system and processes work. Then at the end of six months, we'll sit down and I want you to tell me everything that you feel needs changing. And then we'll look at it and see if we can implement it. Cause by then you'll understand how it all works. Yeah. 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 He said, rarely did anyone come with anything afterwards. Once they saw how everything worked, they went, mm. no, nah, no, nah, I wouldn't make any changes. But occasionally someone would go, why do you do this? And you go, Aha, okay. Mm. There's something that has probably be become outdated yeah, over yeah, a one or two year period. That's a great idea though. That's a really great idea. You know, like again, you're right. Uh, sometimes I guess first off, you can look at ways to change things, but it's, you know, it's out of context. Yeah, yeah, because if you've only seen one part, it's like, well, why do you do that? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but if we don't do that, it affects this, 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 and this. Yeah, yeah, Once yeah. they understand the other things it affects, they go, oh, okay, now I know why it's there. The, the other interesting part about this as a, as a conversation, though, too, Tyson, I think is the fact of, as consumers these days, we're so, um, we're so addicted to new you know, this yeah. concept of newism, that uh, that we, we have to be coming up with new products, new services, new ideas on a regular basis because our consumers, our customers um, expect it. And, and I think that that's an interesting kind of layer of complexity in running a business these days. Because often just as we're getting things right and everything's running smooth, you know, it's nice and it's easy when everything's running, but we don't necessarily live in a world that wants nice and easy. You know, yeah. what we, we kind of live in a world that actually embraces new more than nice and easy. And we have this incredible appetite for it. So in, in businesses that if you're not coming up with the new products, the new services, new ideas, new delivery, new communication, new this, 
all the time and evolving with your clients, you kind of get left behind. So I think there's an interesting kind of balance there. You can be running really well, but does that also then sometimes stifle creativity in a business? Does that stifle the fact of um, us trying to be to be more innovative in how we're delivering our services or our pricing structure? You know, you know, you imagine um, in a, in a medical practice where there's a, a lady behind the counter or a man behind the counter and they've done it for a long, long time, Yeah. right? They've got everything exactly the way that it should be, rah, rah. But those people don't actually like change. Yeah. And those people often don't, you know, like it's, you've got to adopt to their system rather than them adopting to you or adapting to you. And that's okay as long as they're still open enough to say, well, hang on, we need to try something different. We need to be doing something um, you know, we need to be open to different, I, yeah. I, I guess, or open to that. We can't be blinkered. And that's, I think that's the interesting part um, from a consumer point of view. You can be running a great business, but if it's not evolving, you become irrelevant. And, yeah, uh, and, and relevance is the greatest challenge, I think, facing anyone in business these days. Staying relevant is the biggest issue, whether you're an author, podiatrist, uh, freaking, you know, whatever it is, a baker up the road because there's always going to be someone coming along who's going to offer it you know faster cheaper with more whipped cream on top or whatever it's going to be um that's where i see the struggle for people certainly in the work that i do around the place um with a lot of businesses the relevance factor is a tough one yeah. for them to, so would you, you know, would you recommend business owners taking a certain time a week or is it a certain time each month to really just sit down and do critical thinking on the business and just looking at everything and, and also looking at what your, your competitors are doing and thinking, do we need to make changes, like doing that on a regular basis? Mate, I think we need to do it almost daily. You okay. know, like to, to be really honest, you know, a, a really great example of this was um, I was in Japan. I was doing a, a study trip with a client of mine and we went to... Um, I, re I recall you going to Japan, actually. I remember was, seeing all the photos. It was so wild and it was such an interesting experience, this particular trip, because we were doing everything from studying trees for a guy that was doing some stuff and right through to this thing. And we went to a factory um, and this factory uh, started at the same time as Toyota when Toyota started. So, you know, 80 odd years ago, something ridiculous like that now. And uh, and and they were the same two, like they were friends, family, the two, the bloke that started Toyota and the bloke that started this company. I can't remember the name of this company. It's a Japanese name. Um, so Mr. Toyota started and they started making textile stuff and sewing machines. Yeah. And this company started up making parts for the sewing machines and, and bits. And then as Toyota evolved into cars, they started making parts for cars. Then uh, Toyota now are in you know, satellites and boats and farming and building. This business has evolved um, into all of those kind of things. And I met the grandson or the great grandson, it might have even been, of the guy that founded the business. And, uh, and through a translator, I was saying to him, so how have you managed to stay relevant over all of these years, you know, when the world has changed and post-war Japan and, oh, you know, it's like it's, you know, businesses struggle to keep up. And he said, because of something that his grandfather initiated, every single day, three people are chosen um, randomly in, out of that business. There's like 10,000 staff in it now. And these three people, their job is to spend two hours thinking about and talking about in a, a special meeting room for it to just think about what are we going to sell when our customers no longer want to buy what we're making today? Okay, and, it's a good and, question to ask. And the parameters around, we've got this skill sets, we've got these resources, we've got this history, we've got this. So if Toyota says tomorrow we're not going to make cars anymore, do we shut down our company? Do we go, oh, we've got 10,000 people here that can only make ball bearings for some part of the car? Yeah. We, and it's a really interesting thing. What are you going to sell when the customers no longer want to buy what you're selling today? And and that that kind of thinking, and I talk a lot about something, um, I, I call it considered evolution. And, and it's a bit about the, the idea of, you know, we live in a world that's rapidly changing. What we're selling today is probably not what we're going to be selling in two or three years. As in how it's packaged, as in how it's sold, as in the technology, the you know, the, the whatever it might be. We need to be spending time all the time looking at that and going, well, I'm a smart kind of guy. I could look at it and go, well, what, what are the trends in consumers? What are people starting to do? How's that going to impact on my business? Yeah. If I go, well, all my clients are baby boomers. 
Well, there's a problem with that, right? They're they're all going to die. They're getting old. <laughs> Eventually. You know? Not tomorrow, but they're going to die. Um, and if you're saying, well, now I've got to start, I need to be marketing to millennials or Gen Z, is what I'm offering going to be appealing to them? Is it, you know, like, do I need to be a mobile, you know, uh, podiatrist? Do I need to have a, a subscription-based pricing model? Do I have to, you know, like... What is it that people are going to, what are, what are the trends that are happening that now I'm going to be able to kind of say, well, I need to adapt to this. And this is where I come back to that point about businesses losing relevance. Yeah. We look at the taxi industry versus Uber, you know, the oldest example in the world, of course, now it's such a current one, it's all talk to death. But the, the thing was taxi drivers failed to, to see, to, to be relevant, you know, to a large degree. So Uber came along and Uber, I, I think the smartness about Uber wasn't, about moving people around, the smartness with Uber was the fact that they they saw an employment opportunity. Yeah. You know, all these people that wanted, their, their main thing was as an employment company. I mean, you talk to people that, that drive for Uber, it's the convenience, it's the number of hours. I'm a student, I'm a, you know, this, I'm a that, I work whenever I want to, rah, rah, it's, I can I can do that. So, um, and the taxi industry got overtaken simply because of changes in what people wanted. But like most things, it reaches a bit of a balance. And it's kind of come back. Like I use Uber all the time. But if I'm in the city and I need to go somewhere and I look at Uber and it's a three-time surcharge in 10 minutes till I get an Uber or there's a taxi there, I'll get in the taxi. Yeah, convenient. No, we, we've kind of reached that balancing point again. Will there never be taxis on the road? There'll always be taxis on the road. You know, will there be Uber? There'll always be Uber or some derivative. Yeah. But, but we need to turn around and go, well, what impact will it have? Taxi industry had the opportunity to be Uber but it just never did, you know, and, and that's what the problem was. So that point, sorry, mate, it's a very long answer to your oh, question. No, no, I'm enjoying it. This is a great but answer. It, but, but it was a great thing of saying that making time for critical thinking. And for me, look, I do it every day. I try to do it between five o'clock and seven o'clock in the morning where I'm literally researching entrepreneurialism. I'm reading, I'm, you know, like this is there today. I'm reading Company of One, um, Atomic Habits, you know, I, I'm looking at this stuff. I'm going, right, what impact is this going to have? What could I learn from this? What could I teach others? Um, I'm, I'm writing every day. I'm looking at all the top websites in my kind of space, you know, Inc., uh, Entrepreneurs. When, when, when you're reading so much, so many books, reading so many things online, and you've got so many thoughts going through that crazy head of yours, where do you store it? Where do you put well, it? And how do you keep, it, keep this organized? It's a really great question, actually. Um, I have um, a lot of time I'm looking for ideas for speaking topics and, yeah. and examples. So I have a lot of Excel spreadsheets and I have anecdote kind of um, lists in those, pardon me, with links to articles um, and a lot of other stuff. I literally write out um, the key information and I store it um, accordingly by topics as in innovative thinking, um, as in innovate, uh, um, you know, customer service, you know, innovative uh, customer service, you know, marketing, whatever it might be. So I have some broad categories. So I have a research library of documents, links, Excel spreadsheets and stuff like that. Okay. And um, and I'm constantly looking for this stuff. And I think it's like anything, mate. You know what it's like. When you're looking for stuff, you tend to find it. Um, and and I'm, I'm always, and I'm extraordinarily curious uh, about everything everything I'm curious about. And, and I find that that's, that's very helpful too, because there's so many amazing bits of information out there. Like that's why it's never been such a better time to be an entrepreneur because there is so much stuff out there. And, and, and I look at it and go, a lot of what it is, I'm trying to find better ways to explain what I think is happening in the world for business owners, for entrepreneurs. And by looking for those things, I kind of understand them a bit better myself. Okay. You know, it, is a way that if I can find a better way to talk about innovation, it helps me to understand innovation. You know, so if I talk about innovation as coming up with clever ideas, you know, rah, rah, it's a big topic. It's the most search word term on Google. I can talk about that and we all kind of, our eyes glaze over. But if I say, you know, I came across a great example of innovation in Africa and, uh, and this, was, uh, this was in a village where they had problems with elephants would come in and eat all their crops. And, you know- Don't you, you hate that when that happens? I hate it when that happens. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. So, so irritating. <laughs> so irritating. I know. And, uh, and, and again, so what do they do? Do they shoot the elephants? You can't shoot elephants. No. You can't build a fence that's going to keep them out because elephants, is, elephants you know, are not very good at you know, do not enter signs. Yeah. You know, don't really work for them. 
But what they found out at one of these villages, they had a beehive at one end and the elephants never ate the crops near the beehive. So they said, well, let's put beehives all around the, the crop and see what happens. They put beehives all around the crop and the elephants don't go in there because elephants are big scaredy cats and they're afraid of bees. Oh, right? okay. That but is innovative, a, isn't it? They made a bee fence. Now, this to me has all of the wonderful elements of innovative thinking. You know, it's good for the environment. They get honey as a byproduct. It's cheap. Um, you know, it doesn't hurt the elephant in any way. They can grow their, you know, you look at all that stuff and that to me now becomes a great way for me to really think differently about innovation, but also to be able to talk differently about innovation when I'm sharing it as a speaker or writing or whatever it might be. And that goes back to them. They would have done some critical thinking on how can we exactly. fix it instead of just taking oh the first solution and just acting upon it, let's shoot an elephant yep. and getting themselves in trouble. They sat down, critically thought about the problem, found a solution, and then implemented it. Would you say, like even like Blockbuster and Netflix, that Blockbuster forgot to sit down and do their critical thinking? I um no, I don't think so with Blockbuster. I actually think that Blockbuster did sit down and do critical thinking, but they didn't do any action. And, okay. And, and and that was the real difference because it was it was a semi trailer coming with the lights on. You know, like so you was, got your critical, was, you got critical thinking, and then after you do the critical thinking, you then need to yeah. take action on the critical thinking. So, so Blockbuster should have been Netflix. They should have morphed into Netflix. Yeah, you know, like the taxi industry should have morphed into Uber. I was you thinking know, that that they had know, plenty of warning that this was all, happening. All, all the opportunity in the face of the planet, and you look at Netflix. Like I, I was presenting in Perth a little while ago to a guy who, and one of the people in the audience, he had seven Netflix stores in WA. Uh, sorry, um, seven Blockbuster stores yeah. um, in WA. And he was, because I asked the same question, like, did you guys just not freaking see this? And, and he laughed. He said, of course we saw it. You know, he said, you know, we, we're smart people. I said, I, I had, you know, $2 million worth of bloody Blockbuster stores. I must have been smart enough to do that. You know, I lost it all, but yeah. I had, you know... Um, <laughs> And he said, but we we saw this, we saw the end of our existence coming. We, we spoke about it at conferences. We, we you know, we, we could see it coming, but we sat like rabbits in the headlights and we did nothing about it. And, and, and this is what happens in businesses, Tyson, that you and I have both seen many times. I was in England last year. I did a tour, um, the European Union yeah. sponsored me and paid for me to come over and do these, this roadshow around England. And I spoke to thousands of businesses. And the whole idea of this was to talk to these kind of small to medium sized businesses who are generally manufacturing um, about branding themselves for international sales. And, uh, and so exporting, really. And uh, the, the EU were sponsoring it because there was an obligation for them to try and help these British businesses, um, you know, I, I guess, move forward after Brexit. So I would talk to a room full of these, you know, businesses, maybe 100, 200 people per workshop. And I would say to them, so, you know, so, okay, why, why should someone buy what you're selling? The overwhelming answer was because we're British. <laughs> yeah. Okay, right. Okay. And where do you want to sell to internationally? Oh, you know, Germany, France, Spain, Italy. Right. All those countries in the EU who you've just told to shove it up your bum. Yeah. So, so your your export strategy is to sell to those countries who you've told that you don't want to be a part of, and your only marketing advantage is quite simply the fact that you're British. And they had no. I I, I was flabbergasted, Tyson, by the lack of plan b by the by, by the lack of 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 i don't know just going like seriously you you need a bigger competitive advantage than the fact that you're british you know you need to think further and, and it, it blew me away that the lack of critical thinking and the lack of action and the, and the lack of foresight um that these organizations had I think they make great stuff in England, but it doesn't matter. There's other people that make great stuff. Yeah, that's true. So if people are doing critical thinking, are there a couple of questions that are the first questions they should be asking themselves? Really, that's a great question in its own right. I, I think that the, the questions that we need to be focusing on um, are, and that's a really good, it's a really good question, uh, critical thinking question. Sorry, I'm just writing that down. There's a good article in that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one, one, I, I think that we we really need to be really clear on who our customers are. I know that's a bit of a cliche. We, we kind of hear yeah. people say that all the time, 
but we've got to really understand our customers. Not just know who they are, we've got to really understand them. And okay, so it's not just who is your ideal customer, client or patient, it's then then understanding who they are. So exactly. I know I know who I want, but do yep. you understand who they are? Do I really know them? And if I really know them, how do they act? How do they behave? What are their trends that are affecting them? So if your market is millennials, you know, and it's a male orientated product, typically, you know, like, okay, how do they buy? When do they buy? You know, do they buy online? Do they want an in-store experience? Do they look for quality? Do they, you know, is it price driven? Is it not? All those kind of things. So I think we've got to really understand that particular um, person that, that is going to buy from us. I think the next thing that we need to look at is we need to look at our own industry. And I, and I think we've got to say, well, where is it generally in, in a timeline of evolution? Yeah. You know, is it is it stuck? Is it moving forward? Is it making great leaps? Who's the most innovative kind of example in our industry? You know, if you're a podiatrist, who's the most innovative podiatrist on the face of the planet and what are they doing? And is that a one-off kind of unicorn or is that really the future of the business? We, we need to think a little bit about that side of it as well. The third thing I think that I like to do then is I look, look at industries that have got similar kind of characteristics that are beyond where we are now and look at what they've done cross okay. industry cross industry innovation so you look at that and kind of go ah okay so that industry sector was where we are now you know 10 years ago and what did they do to change what did they do to evolve they made the in-store experience way better they um they really embraced digital you know by doing this and this yeah. they went old school they you know they did a whatever it might be there's many examples of all of those three things you know, if you if you look for them, you know, and, and, and again, that point that you say of how often should we do critical thinking? And my point of being, it's something we should be doing all the time, you know, means that we're basically constantly researching what we're doing. But people are very um, linear. So podiatrists tend to research only what other podiatrists are doing, you know, and you and I know your best ideas for podiatry will not come from another podiatry. No, thing. no, They'll come, come outside from the another industry. business. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's that's a big thing for people to shift out of. You know, I, I compare like with like, you know, whereas really to look outside of your industry and say, okay, this business is doing that. They've got the same kind of clients as me, the same conditions, the same challenges, the same this, that, the other, and they've overcome them by doing this. How would that work in my business? But well, one thing I did when I had my podiatry clinic was I got a lot of my ideas in innovation from hairdressing salons. Yeah. And not that like we were in health, we we weren't in in the beauty side of podiatry at all, but I would look at who my target market was, and the hairdressing salons seemed to have a lot of those people in there, and then I was watching what, how hairdressing salons were adapting and and becoming more lively, and more colourful, and more engaging uh, with their with their clients. Yeah, yep. And I went, okay, how how? So sometimes I'd look at any industry and see something that works, and go. How can I apply that to podiatry? Instead yeah. of saying, oh, that wouldn't work in podiatry. It was like, how could, how could I make it work? And not every idea worked, but majority did. But, but you came up with, with, you know, you did what was, to me, is the, the exact outcome that you want from critical thinking or, or, or reflection or observation is, is you try stuff. And it, these days, and I have this conversation a lot with my coaching clients, there, there isn't a silver bullet. There's not that one thing. It's ne there's no one thing that's going to turn your business around. You know, generally, you know, but it's you've got to be trying stuff. And nine out of ten things you try might not work, but it's a business that's constantly trying and evolving and adapting that succeeds. Yeah. And, and I think that that's a part of it. You know, look, a really interesting example for this would be something like if you're in the food industry, like you know, when you go into a restaurant these days, we're told the story of the meal. You know, like where the full description of, of where the fish was caught, its first name, the yeah. name of the fisherman, the name of the guy who built the boat, the name of his wife, the name of their kids. You know, where, like the story of the food we eat is such an important part. Um, if you um, don't do tell that great story about your food and we're becoming an artisan kind of place. I think it was you, was it you that told the story or did I hear it somewhere else and a lady had a brooch? And, no, not me. And the lady went to a, like an auction house and said, uh, I want to sell this brooch. And they said, um, oh, can you tell us a story on the brooch? He said, oh, it's my grandmother's. Right. And he went, yeah, and she said, no, it was, it was my grandmother's brooch. And 
yeah, we found it in a box. I went, right, okay. So he ended up writing this, and then they tried to sell it. They couldn't sell it. Then they put this story of this third-generation family heirloom that had been passed down, and the, and the grandmother who stayed at home, the husband gave it to before he went off to war, and, uh, and she Amazing cherished story. this gift. That oh. So when he dug deep, this, and everything he said was true, but he put this whole story on this brooch. As soon as they put that up there, bang, it sold for double what they were originally asking, and it sold really, really fast. Because yeah, the person yeah. that was buying that brooch wasn't just buying an old brooch. They were buying the history and the story attached to the brooch. And, and this history and the story has value. Yeah. And people, and, and so does the history and value of our business, you know, in terms of credibility and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's so many wonderful examples of if we, if we think a little bit differently, we look outside of our business and we think about what we're seeing and go, how could I apply that? Or what does that mean? For my business or my industry. I mean, I, I came across something the other day, Tyson, that in America, Burger King is offering a subscription model where you can pay, I think it's 20 bucks a month and you can get as much coffee as you want. Right? Oh, right. Unlimited. Okay. Yeah. Now, that's an interesting kind of a take, you know, when you think about it. Like, Burger King is smart. They would have done their homework. They know that you're probably not going to go in there and just get a coffee. You're probably going to buy something else. But they're moving to a subscription model. And that in its own right is very profound because the subscription model is becoming more and more popular for many, many ways of buying things. We're used to, but because of our, you know, our internet, our Netflix, our, you know, our various apps or whatever it is we're using, we're very comfortable paying lots or little. I think it's, I think it's really smart because if I had that subscription, that's where I'm going to get my coffee in the morning. But if you were in my car with me and we were driving somewhere, you say, oh, we should stop and have a coffee. Oh, we'll grab one from uh, Burger King. Yeah. Mine's free, but you're paying for yours. Yep, absolutely. And it costs them you know, 20 cents to make. And it's a low-cost item, yet it's a it's going to get people back to Burger King time and time again. That's a brilliant and, idea. And you look at it and go, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of interesting thought. A couple of years ago, Burger King did another smart thing. They were the first, um, I think, fast food chain to introduce either organic eggs or free-range eggs, I think it was. I couldn't quite recall to every Burger King. And for them, that was a huge thing. They, they literally sucked up all the free-range eggs yeah. available in America in one buying decision. But really, it's a marketing ploy. It's a, it's a big thing, but it's, it's about the future of fast food, you know, saying that, that it's a step in the right direction. I came in, there's a lot of steps needed, but it's a step in the right direction. And that's an interesting thing as well, because why would they do that? There's more expense, it's harder to get supplies, it's more, you know, like it's the distribution network was not as well set up and, um, you know, all of that. It was, it was difficult. It's a difficult thing to do, but they weighed up the promotional value of doing that versus the challenge operationally yeah. and go, well, it's worth it. So we can turn around. If I own a food joint, I would make a big point, no matter what it was, of ensuring that I was offering organic, healthier, you know, organic, biodynamic, line court, environmentally sustainable kind of food options as much as possible because that's without a doubt one of the trends that are kind of pushing forward on that. I think, um, and I think there's also, there's certain industries that are really, really totally engaged with their customers. They're really, really smart and they're great industries to be looking at for innovation. Yeah. You know, and then there's other industries that are still in the 1940s that are great <laughs> examples of what not to do. And, uh, and, and I think we kind of know, you know, many of the old, you know, a lot of these old firms, the banks, to me, banks are still. Oh, you know, the easiest way to identify people that are out of date is just go and grab the yellow pages. Yeah. Grab I'll the yellow pages and, in there. and see who still has a half page ad in the yellow pages. And, they, and you have a look at industries, law industry is one that there's yeah. a, a lot of the old uh, law firms still have the half page ad. In really? the yellow page, yeah, yeah. But I a didn't book, even know you could still get a yellow page. A book arrived the other day on our Dorset, the local directory's guide, I think it was. Right, and, right. And, oh, yeah, and yeah. what was funny, I I grabbed it, and where we used to keep our phone books, I went and looked in the cupboard and went, my God, there's still some from a couple of years ago in here that but I've never wow. looked in here. And the thickness had dropped from like a, an inch and a half to an inch to, to now. Un- <laughs> tally o favor. Um, <laughs> and what I find funny is some of those older law firms will be complaining about these young guys who are probably you know, breaking all the rules and uh, and you're not going to find them in the yellow pages. Which is just hilarious. Now, that's 
old school, but that's not good old school. No, that's bad old school. That's bad old school without without an example. I, I mean, I look at industries like the pet industry. Now, the pet industry is $150 billion, $200 billion a year between England, America, and Australia. It's huge. Yeah. Because our relationships with our pets have changed. They're no longer wild animals that we have chained in the backyard in the dog kennel to, to attack and kill kind of people. No, what mine, mine's are. sitting in the office here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they, they, they're just they're gorgeous parts of the family who we love and cherish and we treat like family members. And we, we you know, like how much do we spend on our dogs now and lovingly spend on them? You know, like we go away, they come on holidays with us. We, yeah. You know, like they're a part of the family. And, uh, and you look at that, the pet industry is one of the most amazing in terms of innovation, marketing, uh, connection, engagement, um, you know, and sales. Well, we, we took it when we went on our last holiday, we were looking for a kennel to put the dog yeah. in because where we normally leave the dog, they were on holidays as well. And they had a list of kennels to look to. And there was one that it, it was the Coranda Puppy Resort. Yep, yep. I remember that. I think that. it's called. And well, I don't think that's a name, but it was it was more of a retreat. It was a it was a yep. dog retreat. Yep. And we went, how cool is that? It's a dog retreat. And we went and had a look at it, and they've got a an old house on this property, and all the bedrooms are converted to dog rooms. That's and each awesome. of the dogs have got their own bedroom. They've got a lounge to sit on. There's TV. It's it's like a house. So the dogs, when they're in there, it doesn't feel like they're in a, a caged area with a bit of sawdust on the ground that gets hosed out every day. They've actually, and we saw that. I went, this is where we'd be bringing our dog all the time. <laughs> so would I. We felt good. We felt good that we were leaving our dog somewhere where it's going to feel comfortable, like it's in a house. It's not in a kennel. It's amazing. And people go, oh, well, that's not for everyone. That's the point. It's not it, for everyone. Exactly. It's not for everyone. There's a place in San Francisco um, that I came across a few years ago. And I think they were 800 US dollars a week. To, to leave your dog there in daycare every day. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was, and you go, no. You try and book your dog in. Yeah. It's fully booked. There's, there's no more space. This place is booked out. It's like, it's ridiculous. And you kind of go, seriously? Like, yeah, there's, it's a great industry because, you know, we, we will do anything for our dogs or our cats or, or whatever our pets are. So there, there's great learning lessons from that kind of stuff. It's just like the disasters. The greatest gift of the global financial crisis was to see that that if you lose your relevance, you know, with your customers, you will be punished these days. Quick, No matter how successful you are today, yeah, it doesn't matter. That's not going to get you through tomorrow. You know, and, and, and I think that we forget that. I think we could do that in the past. You know, our, our reputations would keep us going, you know, through good times and bad times if you had a good reputation. Um, but I think now because this this new thing that's going on, people are far more open to, you know, I love what you do, but I'm going to try there. Yeah. You know, because they've got something new. They're, they're offering something a little bit different. I, I like their, their approach. And, and I think that that's, this is a bit of the challenge that we've got to be facing. We've got to be so in tune with our customers, so aware with what they want, so connected and and so open to communicating as you were talking about, that we are constantly developing our business with them. Not, not you know, they're over there and we're over here. They're a part of our evolution as we're moving forward. And um, and I think that that's, that's really smart to do that in business. Um, and I think so many of the old models now that we're seeing business-wise are just falling apart, you know, because... That's not what consumers want anymore. This this has been all brilliant advice. And I wanted to eventually talk about book writing, but we've been speaking for almost 55 minutes. Uh, <laughs> we can do that another time. Well, that's what I was thinking. Can I get you back? Yeah, of course. Because I, I want to get on to uh, what you're doing as yeah, like mm. as, a, as a writing coach. And I know you also got, is it Publishers Central or Publish Central? Publish Central with Michael Hanrahan. Yeah, we've yeah, got a book so, awards that we're announcing soon. Yeah, yeah. So I want to I want to get you back and talk about more about the whole publishing, writing, coaching, that type of thing. But at the moment, if people want to get hold of you, the easiest way is just to go to andrewgriffiths.com.au. Andrew yep, absolutely, mate. Yeah, well, Google me. Just you know, Google like you. You're everywhere. I, I'm, I'm easy to find. Easy to find. But it's a good rave, Tyson. I, I enjoyed that. You know, it's nice because I think you and I are really aligned in our in our views on business as well. But we're also able to look at how it was, you know, when we were boys, but also how it is. And 
And the, the one thing that I think the either of us are uh, caught on is, is we don't do it the way that we did it because we yeah. know that that's no longer relevant. You know, there's nice elements we could pull out of it, some of the old school stuff, but what got us here won't get us there kind of concept um, is such a, a powerful thing. So it's great to have a rave about that. Um, and we're both passionate about it. Yeah, and I, I love unscripted conversations. Yeah, me too. Me <laughs> when too. Uh, you know, if I have a look at yeah the questions I had written down, I'll show did you, you here. Did you ask any of them? No, I had, yeah, a, blank, yeah. I had a blank sheet of paper. <laughs> I had your name written down there, but I had nothing that I was going to. There was no specific question I was going to ask you because I knew we would just free flow this whole conversation, and I yeah, knew absolutely. it was going to go in different directions. And anyone listening to this who haven't got something from it, as I usually say, give yourself an uppercut. Uh, and go back and, and uh, listen. What do you normally say to people? Yeah, take two panel and have a lie down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. That's right. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, but it is an amazing time to be in business, isn't it? it is, I, like, I love being in business. It's, um, I've always enjoyed it. It was something when I was younger, going through uni, I always wanted to work for myself, always mm. wanted to just do my own thing. And even though I've sold the podiatry businesses now, I it's still, yeah, I'm doing coaching for podiatrists. So it's just something that I, I will never stop doing. Mm, so, good on you, mate. I love that. So, Andrew, thank you very much for being on It's No Secret with Dr. T, and we will organise another time to get you to come back, and we're going to talk about book writing and the whole other side of Andrew Griffith. So thank you very much. You're welcome, mate. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to Andrew Griffiths today, and I must admit, every time I talk to Andrew... I end up with a million ideas bouncing around in my head. It's almost like Ricochet Rabbit. It's like ping, ping, ping. Now, if you don't know who Ricochet Rabbit is because you're too young, go and Google Ricochet Rabbit. It will change your life. It was a great cartoon. And I just wanted to touch on again, don't rule out old school marketing. Like we said, yellow pages, that's bad old school. But some of the ideas, brochures, business cards, think about those sort of things and how you can actually use them in your business. Because if nobody else is doing it, then maybe you should be. Don't rule out doing a hard copy newsletter. And remember, allow time for strategic thinking. Like I was asking Andrew, should it be done weekly or monthly? And I love how Andrew said it should be done on a daily, a daily basis. You've got to stay relevant and you've got to have considered evolution for your business. So where is your business going? Where is your where is your industry going? And can you use what's happening in other industries and use what is happening there in your own industry and actually make us make a big change, make a pivot in what you're actually doing. So before I go, I just wanna mention my book, It's No Secret, There's Money in Small Business. And if you're a podiatrist, you might enjoy It's No Secret, There's Money in Podiatry. And there is, if you're doing it the right way. There's money in all business, if you're doing things the right way and you, you're game enough to make changes when changes are required. Just because your business is doing well now doesn't mean it's always going to be that way. You've got to stay on top of things. And two other things, I've got two events coming up, one in Liverpool in October and one on the Gold Coast in November. Now there, it's marketing for podiatrists. Now this, these will be podiatry only events, that's what I'm gonna be talking about. But if you're not a podiatrist, like Andrew mentioned, sometimes some of your best ideas can come from other industry so if you want to sit in come along to the to these events please go to my website tysonfranklin.com check the details and see if it's something that may actually interest you so that's it for me this week look after yourself look after your family and i will talk to you again next week and in the spirit of sharing here's a couple of snippets of some other podcasts that i enjoy listening to on a regular basis bye for now my name is eric hunley and i host unstructured on Unstructured, I have intimate conversation with a diverse range of people. I've interviewed a presidential candidate and a felon, not the same person. I've even chatted with a musher, yep, a sledder behind a pack of dogs. And in these conversations, we learn what drives these folks. Please, come check out Unstructured. You can find Unstructured wherever you listen to podcasts. I did not grow up with very much money. Money's energy. Money is something that, that really scares me. You had about 60 grand in debt. Money isn't the answer. Somebody should just give me a lot of money. My dream was to be the WWE wrestler, but you realize that your dreams change over the years. Money is a tool. It's a key to a gate. And at the other side of the gate is the things that you really want to do with your life. It's the things that matter most to you. It's pursuing those values that make you ultimately happy. Listen to Inspired Money at inspiredmoney.fm. Welcome. Uh
everybody to this promo for my show, Business with Super Joe Pardo, where I break down business lessons week after week after week after week after week. Whether you are new or a seasoned vet at business operations, my show will help you take your business game to the top. Looking forward to meeting you over at superjoepardo.com.